Let's start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Remember, O most compassionate Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, we fly unto thee, O Virgin, our virgins, our mother. To thee do we come, before thee we stand, sinful and sorrowful. Mother of the Word incarnate, despise our petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer them. Our Lady, seed of wisdom and spouse of the Holy Spirit, St. Joseph, St. Francis, St. Maximilian Colby, St. Pio. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. It's a great honor to be here in Poland, especially to give a talk on one of the greatest sons that Poland ever produced, and that's St. Maximilian Kolbe, truly one of the greatest saints the church has ever had. And we could see how God takes care of his people that throughout the history of Christendom, he sends us these great lights these great saints to guide us, especially in troubled times. Where there's more sin, there's more grace that abounds. And so we could see throughout history, when the heresies pop up, how God raises up great saints like St. Saint Athanasius, the Protestant Revolution, which is still going on, raised up some of the greatest saints St. Ignatius Loyola, St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa of Avila, and so on. And so when we came to the last century, God sent us some very, very powerful saints. And we could see, he gave us, we were blessed to have one of the greatest popes, St. Pius X. And he warned us about what we're living now. In his encyclical Pascendi, he condemns modernism, he describes it, he points it out, because it's important to identify the enemy. And then Our Lady comes, and today it is a blessing to speak on her feast day of the, of the miracle of the sun, October 13th, witnessed by over 70,000 people. And so Our Lady came, and we'll talk about that. And the church gave us the great St. Maximilian Kolbe at the same time. And so we see that St. Maximilian was born in 1894 into a very pious family. His mother and father were third order members of the Franciscan order. And this is the importance of family life. And there's many things we could learn from all these saints in their life. Everything matters. To God. And so he sends St. Maximilian into a family that is deeply, deeply Catholic, totally. And the Colby family lived in a very difficult history for Poland. Poland was an enslaved country at the time, three powerful nations bordering it Russia, Austria, and Prussia had swallowed up Poland. And during the Russian rule, there were no Polish schools were allowed, and therefore St. Maximilian Kolbe was, and his brothers were homeschooled, that his mother and father his mother, had to teach him. My friends, sometimes, you know, the ultimate thing the church says is that we must have a proper Catholic education, but sometimes that's impossible. And we're living in a time, too, today, where many families have to resort to homeschooling because there's no real Catholic schools around. They're Catholic by name only. And so in the United States, I, know, I don't know if the movement here is strong, but many people are forced, and it's heroic to homeschool your children. But better to do that than to send them to these devils and let them be stripped of their faith and morals. And so, once again, as I said yesterday, many people run from the cross. But it's through the cross that God purifies us and sanctifies us. And growing up in an area, in a time of, in Poland, that was, you know, a very tough time. 
Many graces flow from that. They lived a total life of poverty. They hardly were able to make means of food, clothing. But they worked hard and they prayed even harder. So he was brought up in a very pious atmosphere. They were rich in their faith. And that's what kept matters. So here, once again, we see the importance of the family. In one sense, our Lord, of course, is the cornerstone of the church, the foundation. But without holy families, we're lost. Where did the vocations come from? If the families are under attack, and if the family, that's why the family is under attack. Our lady, our sister Lucia, said that the final battle will be in the family, that the devil will attack the family. And so in the Gospel of Matthew, we read from our Lord, and everyone that heareth these my words and does them not shall be like a foolish man that built his house upon the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and they beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall thereof. The, the family is, is so, so important once again. And that's why it's under attack. Father Matteo, he was a great priest, a preacher. He is the founder of the home enthronement. And Father Matteo, I quote him, he says, You can tell the strength of a nation by judging the strength of the family. Once again, you can tell the strength of of a nation by judging the strength of the family. I could tell you in America that the family has been so attacked that it's so weak now our country because of that. And so St. Maximilian called me, God put him into a family where he can blossom, where he can grow in the faith. Once again, Sister Lucia's uh, statement to Cardinal uh, Kafara said that the final battle between the Lord will be between... The Lord and the kingdom of Satan will be about marriage and the family. And we could see throughout the whole world how the family is being attacked, that they're trying to change the definition of what a family is, a man and a woman. God has given us marriage as a sacrament, and nobody can change that, no matter what they say. Today you hear this nonsense, two mommies, two daddies, and this is disgusting. And your country, I know, is under attack by the LGBTQT communities and everything else. And they're being funded by these enemies of the church, what we'll talk about. And we must stand up and defend Christ and his church. And St. Maximilian, he gives us the means to do this. In the apparition of Our Lady of Good Success, over four, almost 400 years ago, a lady prophesied to Mother Mariana. She said, the sacrament of matrimony, which symbolizes the union of Christ with the church, will be thoroughly attacked and profane. And it is. So I'm going to speak about these attacks in a little while and how St. Maximilian Kolbe gives us the means to overcome them. When St. Maximilian was a young boy, a lady appeared to him. And the Blessed Mother said to him, he told his mother, One day when I was praying in the church before the picture of Mary Immaculate, she suddenly came alive and showed me two crowns. One was white, the other red. The first was a symbol of purity, the second of martyrdom. She asked me if I, would if I would like to have one. And his mother said, and what did you say? And he says, I chose both. This is a very, very important time, uh, event in St. Maximilian's life that will affect the rest of his life. He was handpicked by the mother of God for a mission. And this is important. Because each of us have a mission from God. Each of us are called to fulfill the role that God has called us to. And we must discern what that role is. 
And God, our Lord, gives us the grace to figure out our vocation. Our vocation is connected to our salvation. And so, so many people don't pray about what God has called them to. What does God want? And the safest way to find out our vocation is to pray to the Immaculate. And so Our Lady chooses St. Maximilian to be her chosen one, her knight. So St. Maximilian eventually entered the Franciscan order in 1910. And at one point, he was ready to leave because he thought he was being called to a military career. And so he wanted to fight for the freedom of Poland. And his mother talked him out of it, telling him, you will never get a martyr's crown for that. I'm sure Our Lady wants you to be a soldier, but a soldier for God and the church. And you could see that that vision helped keep him in line, in, in, in line with God's will. And of course, his mother knew it. She kept St. Maximilian on the road that God has called him to. And that's the, 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 the role of a holy family, a mother and father, to guide their children to do God's will, not their will, but God's will. And St. Maximilian Kobe followed the will of God. He followed in the footsteps of my holy, our Holy Father, St. Francis, the founder of the Franciscan order. He, too, actually became a knight, St. Francis. And he was in wars and battles. And then God revealed to him a dream that that was not the weapons that he wanted him to use to fight the war, that he was to fight it spiritually. And so all these great saints, St. Francis, St. Maximilian, St. Ignatius of Loyola, they have this militant spirit because the church is a church triumphant, the church suffering, and the church militant. And so God raises up saints like St. Maximilian that has this fighting spirit to fight for him and his kingdom because that's where the real battle is. Our Lord tells us, St. Paul, that we do not fight against flesh and blood, but the principalities of the world. We could see in October, once again, 13, 1917, we could see all the apparitions of Our Lady of Fatima. Uh, at that time, Our Lady comes and she warns us of what the problem, how Russia will spread her errors throughout the whole world. She identifies the enemy. She tells us that Russia's errors, we know what they are, communism, which leads to atheism. And she identifies this, that if Russia is not consecrated, her errors will spread throughout the whole world. And they have been. And they are right now. They're in America. The land of the free is not the land of the free. They're here. They never left here. The communists are still alive spreading their errors. But also she inspired St. Maximilian Kolbe, and she identifies another enemy, not only the communists, but the Freemasons. On October 1917, in uh, St. Maximilian Kolbe witnessed an unforgettable scene on the 200th anniversary of the founding of Masonry, when right under the window of the Pope in Vatican Square, a gigantic banner was carried with the inscription, Satan will take over the Vatican. The Pope will be Satan's slave. My friends, that is scary because it was true. This is true over 100 years ago. The Masons, the sons of the devils, Satan will take over the Vatican. The Pope will be Satan's slave. We could see that is taking place right now, my friends, without a doubt, that Satan has taken over the Vatican. It's not just this Pope. All the post-conciliar popes, all of them have been under the reign of Satan, if you study and you see. And I'm going to bring out some of these things. So when St. Maximilian Kolbe saw this, he witnessed this, 
He has such a love for the church, and he has a militant spirit in the prop that he wants to fight for God and God's glory. That he wants to convert souls and bring souls to God. And that he's willing to lay his life down. He went to the rector of the seminary for permission to go to the headquarters of the Masons to convert the Grand Master himself. This little Polish boy, he was a very petite man. He was, but he was a giant because he was filled with the Spirit of God. And when you're filled with the Spirit of God, you don't fear nothing because nothing's more powerful than God. St. Maximilian Colby, totally under the mantle of the Blessed Virgin Mary, is wants to go to the Grand Master. And who does that remind you of? His Holy Father, my Holy Father, St. Francis. St. Francis had a great desire to be a martyr. And St. Francis wanted to go to Africa to the head sultan to convert them because Islam is religion from hell. And you can't save your soul outside the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. You cannot. There is no salvation outside the one holy Catholic apostolic church. That is the fundamental dogma that's being denied. That is a fundamental dogma that has been denied, especially since the Second Vatican Council. And that's the one that's being denied right now in Rome. And it's devastating. And so what happened when St. Francis went to the sultan? They came and they arrested him and they bring him before the sultan. And did he, did he, did he give in to political correctness like they tell us to today? No. He challenged them. He, he wanted to convert them. And the sultan offered him a uh, woman. He said, no, I took a vow of chastity. He offered him money, and that really impressed him, because he said, I don't want money, I don't want land. I want your soul for Jesus Christ. And I'm willing to die for it. And so he challenged him, like the old prophets. Let's get a bonfire going here, a big one. He goes, I challenge your priest and myself to walk through this fire, and whoever has the true God will come out unharmed. And what do you think happened? The Islamic priests ran like cowards because they know that God is the devil. That's what they did. And the sultan was so impressed, he wanted to convert. But he was afraid what the people would do. And St. Francis wept because they let him go and he didn't die a martyr. But our Lord had another martyrdom for him, and that's when he received the stigmata. He said it would have been much easier to die a martyr. And so we see that St. Maximilian Kobe has the spirit of his holy father, the Franciscan spirit, that they take the gospel serious, that St. Maximilian understood when our Lord said to the apostles at the ascension, right before he ascended into heaven, go to all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. It's not an option. It's a command. And when you see the vicar of Christ telling and, and, and saying that proselytizing is evil, he's going directly against the gospel in Christ's words. John the 23rd, the Pope of the Council, he, when he opened up the Council, he promised, he said to the Russians, we will not condemn communism, even though the church condemned it many times already, and we will not proselytize. How can the vicar of Christ go against a direct command from God? And here's a little St. Maximilian Colby on fire with the love of God that wants to go convert the Grand Master. St. Maximilian Colby so was inspired with six other friars on October 16th Three days from now, Wednesday, will be the, and it's a blessing to be here. And I'm going to go to Neil Pocolano, myself, with the grace of God, and to Auschwitz. On October 16th, four days after the miracle of the sun in Fatima, he founded the Militia of the Immaculate, or the Knights of the Immaculata. What a gift to, from God. 
And one of the main prayers that St. Maximilian Kolbe always prayed, and they water it down today, but he would pray this, O Mary, conceive without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee, and for all who do not have recourse to thee, especially for the Freemasons. You have to identify the enemy. You're in a war, and the devil, one of his greatest weapons to get us to believe that we're not in a war, that everything's all right, and don't speak up. And that's no good. To be silent. A lady of good success over 300 years ago told her that in the, t in the future, in our time, she said, in the tragedies of the church, she said, the time where though the people, those who should cry out, will remain silent. And so St. Maximilian Kolbe now, head on, take it on the Masons, not, not to kill them, but to convert them and to help people. And that's why the church is always in, in, in councils, real ecumenical councils. What's the purpose of a real ecumenical council? Vatican II wasn't a real ecumenical council. A real ecumenical council comes together. Why? Because there's errors and heresies throughout the church. And then the church identifies the enemy, identifies the heresy, and say, no, this is heresy. And then the church would define a dogma that explains what Christ taught the apostles, a dogma that's always been in the deposit of faith that was taught by Christ to the apostle. A pope can't make up a dogma. A council can't make up a dogma. And then the church comes out after they identify the heresy, they condemn it, then they come out with the charitable anathema. That anyone who holds this error is anathema. Outside Holy Mother Church, you can't save your soul unless you repent. And it's charitable why. Number one, the church condemns these errors to protect the faithful who have fallen into them. And then number two, for the good of those souls who are holding the errors. So St. Maximilian, a true knight of Our Lady, identifies the enemy now. So we got the communists and we got the Masons. There's a connection because the Masons funded the Bolshevik revolution, you know, financially. It's the same devils. The Masons, the communists, they're atheists. It's naturalism. The Masons we know by people who have been converted from the Masons say that the two secrets, it's a secret society. The two secrets is number one is that their, enemy, their greatest enemy and who they want to destroy is the Catholic Church. And then the other secret is the higher ranking Masons offer sac of black masses sacrifice to Satan. They're Satanists. Now, the lower ones are deceived because they say it's just a social club, but the higher ones are truly evil, and we have men that have been converted. So the goal of the militia of the Immaculate is to convert the whole world and each individual soul to the end of time, to the sacred heart of Jesus through the Immaculate. Every person is to consecrate themselves to the Blessed Virgin. The St. Maximilian Kolbe uses the term that when you consecrate yourself to the Blessed Virgin Mary, you become her possession, her property. St. Louis de Montfort used the term, you become a slave of Our Lady. But today, we don't have a good concept of what it means to be a slave of Our Lady. So St. Maximilian Kolbe comes up with this thing. We become the possession, the property of Our Lady, okay, to be used as an instrument in our hand, to crush the head of the serpent for the salvation and sanctification of all souls. That's the main purpose of the, FR, uh, the militia of the Immaculate to become an instrument of Our Lady, to help crush the head of the serpent. So when we consecrate ourselves to the Blessed Virgin, we're basically going to Christ the way he came to us, through his mother, that Christ is the head of the mystical body. 
and that we who are baptized in the church make up the body, but what connects the head to the body? The neck. And so Our Lady is called the nexus by the fathers. And that's why, as Father Rodriguez spoke about yesterday, her role is so important, is that she is the mediatrix of all graces, that every grace you ever received or any other human being ever received comes through the hands of the Blessed Virgin from Christ, but through the hands. She is full of grace. When the angel came there, he didn't say, Hail Mary. He said, Hail, full of grace. All the grace that Eve lost for us was given to the mother of God. And they given to her to give to whom she wants, when she wants, and as much as she wants. And that's why we know when she came in the mirac uh, Our Lady uh, of the Miraculous Medal, in the image, she has her hands out, and the rays are coming out of her hands. And St. Catherine Labore said to her, what are all those rays? What are all the different colors? And she said, these are special graces that I want to give to my children, but they don't come to me. If they come to me, I will give them special graces. See, Maximilian Kolbe embraced this totally. He understood it 100%. And he realized that this got to go to the Blessed Mother. And that's why, what do you think the devil, he poisons all these Protestants in the Protestant Revolution, it was, you know, to, to, to despise Our Lady, to blaspheme her. And that's why we have to make reparations for the sins, because you can't get to heaven without the Immaculate. You can't. St. Maximilian knew that. She is in control. And God uses the Immaculate because she is filled with humility. She, as we know from Genesis 3.15, he said, our Lord, when he kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden, he said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, her seed and your seed, you shall strike at her heel, and she shall crush your head. The devil has no power over the Immaculate, none. And that's why when we put us, ourselves under her mantle and we submit to her an act of humility, it crushes, we help crush the head of Satan. And so when we consecrate ourselves, St. Maximilian told, we give ourselves totally to her. We give Our Lady everything. We surrender our whole life to her. In this world and in the next, he says, that we entrust her with our whole life. Our body, soul, our mind, our will, our intellect, our memory, we submit to Our Lady. That when all the merits that we accumulate in our life as Catholics, we give all our merits to the Blessed Virgin. We give her everything. That when we receive Holy Communion, we give those merits to the Blessed Virgin to do what she wants with those merits. And so when we become part of the militia of the Immaculate, we too are in the battle against Satan. And we contribute to saving souls. St. Maximilian Kolbe realized this. He realized that. And that's why he accomplished so much. Because St. Louis de Moffa used an example. When he tells us that when we perform acts, even if we, our motives are not pure. And so, you know, it's tainted. And so he used a simple example, St. Louis de Moffat, of consecration, it's how it works. He says the king is sitting on his throne and the queen is on his right. And there's a group of people bringing up gifts to the king. And, uh, and the queen realizes midway down the line there's a peasant. And the peasant is all shabby, dirty. And she knows the king will not accept will not accept the peasant like that. And so she excuses herself from the king, and she grabs the peasant and says, come to me, I want to help you. And she takes the apple, the peasant had an apple, and she says, let me have the apple. And she shines the apple up, she makes it pretty, she puts it on a gold plate, puts flowers, and she now escorts the peasant to the king. And because the, and the king sees his mother, uh, his queen bringing the peasant, he accepts that. Well, that's what happens when we're consecrated to the Immaculate. When we do the littlest act of charity, it could be anything, 
Anything, everything we do in the state of grace, we receive merit. But we give that merit, we give that to Our Lady, and then it's her merit. And she magnifies that merit because she takes the impurities out of it. And she can magnify it a million times, whatever. And so when we give graces like that to Our Lady, St. Maximilian Colby, St. Louis de Montfort tells us, she, wa- she knows how to glorify God, the ultimate, at every second. She knows her son's will at every moment right now. So there could be a soul, say, in China, ready to die right now, and for some reason, God wants that soul saved. And because you do an act of charity for Our Lady, some, you do something nice, say, for someone you don't like, that you have a hard time with. And you say, Blessed Mother, I'm going to do this for you, for love of you. And you do an act of charity. And she, she could save that soul dying. And those that live out the consecration to Our Lady, she protects us. She ain't going to show you the fruits. Sometimes she may. But in the end, when you get to heaven and you get there and Our Lady's there, uh, you're going to see the fruits of your consecration. All the people, because this is the beauty that nobody goes to heaven alone. No one goes to hell alone. No one. When God, he created the human race, he created it, nothing exists before, right? And he created his own will. He didn't, not, he didn't cooperate with anyone or anything. He created us. But after the fall of man... He did not uh, want man to redeem himself without the help of others. Number one, Christ comes to redeem us. And how does he come to us? This is how God crushes the head of the serpent. Because Lucifer, we know, in the Franciscan school of theology, and you can read about this in the book, The Mystical City of God, Venerable uh, Maria of Agreta. She tells us what happened. Because the angels were born in sanctifying grace, and the angels, but they had to merit heaven, just like we have to merit heaven. So there was a test. And what was the test? It was revealed to the angels that the second person of the Holy Trinity, Jesus Christ, would take flesh of a virgin. And that virgin would be queen of heaven and queen of earth. And Satan revolted. He said, no, non servion I will not serve because... A human nature is below angelic nature. He says, no way I'm going to bow down to a woman whose uh, her nature is below me. And so they were kicked out. And they only had one chance. They had said the devils. The ain't, they were devils now. They were kicked out of heaven. They didn't get a second chance like we do many times. And they were cast into the pit of hell. And so... In order to redeem man, how can man be redeemed now? You know, after the fall of Adam and Eve, how can man, uh, we com- Adam and Eve committed a grave mortal sin. And that mortal sin kept the gates of heaven closed. And there had to be reparation for the sin of man. And a man has to make that reparation because he committed the sin. And so God takes flesh of the virgin. And when he takes flesh of the virgin, he becomes a man like us in all things except sin. He's, he has a human nature, but he's a divine person. So every act he commits, performs, is infinite, and he can make reparation. But it was he wanted the fiat from the Blessed Virgin. So in the Garden of Eden, the devil comes to a virgin Eve, and he deceives her, he lies to her, he gets her to give in to curiosity, and she falls, and the whole human race falls. Now God sends another angel, and that was Satan who came to her, a fallen angel. Now God sends a good angel, Gabriel, to the Blessed Virgin, the virgin predestined to be the mother of God. And she overdoes, and of course, Eve's disobedient, she obeys, she tests the spirit. She didn't just say yes to Gabriel. How can I, how can I, be with child. I don't know man. And so it's true her fiat that man is able to be saved. Because God chose to redeem us in a particular way. Drew the Virgin Mary. 
And don't, nobody should have the audacity to question that. Because when God does something, he does it the most perfect way. And as St. Maximilian Colby says, the Immaculate is the masterpiece of God. The masterpiece. Totally one with him. And so the devil has no power over her. And when we place ourselves under her protection, we are totally protected. And so we see St. Maximilian Colby embraces this. And this is what made him so, so powerful against the enemy. So, once again, we see Our Lady at Fatima. She warns us about Russia spreading the errors. And then she inspires St. Maximilian Colby to found the militia of the Immaculate to fight the Masons. My friends, the Masons came out with a, a book called The Permanent Instruction of the Alta Vendita. It was a secret document acquired from the highest lodge in Italy. <clears throat> okay? And in this document, it boldly details precisely how the papacy will be won over to the free Masonic philosophy and beliefs, and its central tenets cannot be repeated too often. So this is the Masons telling us what's going to happen. And this is what inspired, that's why St. Maximilian Kobe identified him. This is the enemy. Our Lady showed him. And when he saw them saying that Satan, the Pope will take, will reign in the Vatican. Satan will reign through the Pope. So I'm going to quote from the Alta Vendita. Okay? The Pope, whoever he may be, will never come to the secret societies. It is for the secret societies to come first to the church with the aim of winning them both. The work which we have undertaken is not the work of a day, nor month, nor year. It may last years, a century perhaps, but in our ranks, the soldier dies and the fight continues. This is the enemy speaking. It's, this is... Unbelievable what they wrote here. It goes on. Now, then, in the order to secure us a pope according to our own hearts. They're, they're, they're almost prophesying. We're going to have a pope after their own heart. It is necessary to fashion for that pope a generation worthy of the kingdom of which we dream. Leave on one side old age and middle life. Go for the youth and if possible, even for the children. The reputation of a good Catholic and good patriot will open the way for our doctrines to pass into the hearts of the young clergy and go even to the depths of converts, and convents. Excuse me. In a few years, the young, the young clergy will have, by the force of events, invaded all offices, they will govern, administer, and judge. They will form the council of the sovereign. They will be called upon to choose the pontiff who will reign. Next, they will rejoice over the outcome of a free Masonic naturalistic pope reigning on the chair of St. Peter. The goal is so beautiful that we must put all sails to the wind in order to obtain it. If you want to revolutionize Italy, look for the Pope who portra whose portrait we have just drawn. Do you want to establish the reign of the chosen ones on the throne of the Hura Babylon? Let the clergy march under your banner while they naively believe they are marching under the banner of the apostolic keys. Do you want to wipe out the last vestige of the tyrants and oppressors? Cast out your nets like Simon Barjona. Cast them deep into the sacristies, the seminaries, and the monasteries, rather than at the bottom of the sea. And if you do not rush things, we promise you a catch more miraculous than this. The fishermen of fish became a fisherman of men. You too will fish some friends and lead them to the feet of the apostolic sea. You have preached revolution in Tiara and Cope, proceeded under the cross and the banner of revolution that will need only a little help to set the quarters of the world on fire. My friends, that is devastating because everything that they said would happen has happened. 
They have taken over. They say they will, once again, they will form the council of the sovereign. They will be called upon to choose the pontiff who will reign. They're talking about the college of cardinals who are infiltrated by masons and communists. How do you think we ended up with Pope Francis? But it's not only him. It's all the post-conciliar popes. From John the 23rd on, they all fit what we have just read here. Paul VI, John Paul II, Benedict the Sixteenth, And I hear these things how people think like Benedict was an orthodox pope. You don't know him. You haven't studied. He preached heresy throughout his whole priesthood. These abominations that took place. Like they, told, they go for the seminaries. They, they indoctrinated them with naturalism. And that's why the council is so evil. The council, I believe, one day will be condemned by a true pope when he comes and will condemn this nonsense. There's heresies in the Second Vatican Council. False ecumenism, religious liberty, freedom. This is all from hell, my friends. And this is what they did. They have taken over. And this is why, my friends, our only hope is in Our Lady. Maximilian know that. She's our hope. She's the one who crushes his head. Not us. We could do it with her and be part of her army. But this is what's going on. Totally infiltrated. In, in, Bella Dodd was a communist, and she was converted by Bishop Fulton Sheen. She testified in front of the U.S. Congress. She said that she was responsible as a communist for infiltrating the church by men into the priesthood over 1,100 of them. 1,100 of them. One woman, one woman, communist. And so we could see how these masons and communists have infiltrated the church, infiltrated the priesthood. These bishops, they fit it all. They don't have supernatural faith. They don't. They all believe in religious liberty and freedom. They all believe, uh, and I'm going to quote, quote right now, from Pope Gregory the 16th. He originally acquired the Alta Vendita document, which places its composition likely within the years of his pontificate from 1831 to 1846. In 1832, he issued the encyclical Morari Vos on liberalism and religious indifferentism. So now, here's a holy pope. He's identifying the enemy, telling us, beware. And this is the enemy St. Maximilian saw and fought against. And so here are some of the condemnation in Morari Vos. Tell me if it doesn't sound familiar to you. Number one, the abominable conspiracy against clerical celibacy condemns it. Of course. This is what the enemy is going to be promoting. Number two, Anything contrary to the sanctity and indissolvability of honorable marriage of Christians. Number three, indifferentism. The perverse opinion is spread in, in which the perverse opinion is spread on all sides by the fraud of the wicked who claim that it is possible to obtain the eternal salvation of the soul by profession of any kind of religion as long as morality is maintained. Another one, the erroneous proposition which claims that liberty of conscience must be maintained for everyone. And then another one, the plan of those who desire to separate the church from the state, okay, and to break the mutual concord between temporal diary and the priesthood. Whoa. I'm just throwing a few things at you, my friend. Who does this describe? Pope Francis, 100%. The bomb conspiracy against... Clerical celibacy, that's what they're taking apart right now in Rome, in this diabolical Amazon Senate. Going right for it. It's no surprise. The documents have been done a long time. This is just a facade that they use. Anything contrary to the sanctity and indissolubility of honorable marriage of Christians. Are you for real? Amoris Letizia is from the pits of hell. They, the Pope is saying that it's pleasing to God in that document to, for these people committing adultery at times. Are you, in the history of the church, we never had a Pope 
encouraging people to commit adultery. And now we do. Popes encourage people to become saints. And so we see once again. And, and, and the Argentina bishops, they wrote to Pope Francis and they said, what is the correct interpretation of this, your holiness? All this nonsense of the dubia, these weak cardinals and bishops, they're, not, they're spineless. There's not one real cardinal bishop in the whole world, I don't think. We, we got doubts. I don't have no doubts. A second grader reading the Baltimore Catechism can tell you the Morris Letitia is from the devil. It's heresy. Heresy. Okay, what's the true interpretation, Your Holiness? There's only one interpretation, Pope Francis said, that divorced, remarried can receive the sacraments. He put that in the AAS, the Acts of the Apostolic See. Those are for official magisterial documents, trying to, you know, heretical documents now in the Acts of the Holy See. Indifferentism, once again, all religions are equal. All religions are. This has been going on since the Council. And people, you should be scandalized when you look at the Vatican, what went on in the gardens the other day, the pagan rituals with the goddesses of fertility. There was a Franciscan priest, shame on him, on his knees bowing down with those pagans, worshiping the devil, and the Pope is there participating. That's not the first time we had these pan-religion uh, meetings. Unfortunately, John Paul, he started it all in Assisi. And it wasn't just one Assisi, it was many. And Ratzinger, Benedict carried it on. When John Paul walked into the, my Holy Father's Basilica, the tabernacle was open, empty. They dethroned our Lord. And they put a statue of Buddha on top. That's a desecration of the temple. And there was two Buddhist monks offering incense on their knees to a false god. And John Paul basically goes on to say <clears throat> that there was basically, that's the spirit and fruition of Vatican II. I have the quote. I could give it to you. He had animus come up with Curry's dung, play on him, put it on his head. That's participation in pagan rituals. He, dra he drank potions in the South Pacific. He had Mayan death dance on the liturgy drawing down in Mexico. I go on and on. And I'm not saying this, but I'm saying this is not just now. What Pope Francis is doing is what all the popes conciliate popes, but he just keeps escalating it to this natural end. This is the natural end of Vatican II. And this is why our Lord raised up St. Maximilian Kobe to fight these Masons. And that's how we got to fight. Not with weapons, physical, but with Our Lady. So, my friends, that quote from St. John Fisher is devastating where he says, the fort is betrayed even of them that should have defended it. I'm going over this because it's important that you understand your enemy. How can you win a war if you don't even know who your enemy is. How are you going to get to heaven if, if you can't, you know, protect yourself? So I want to read one more time, and then I'll go on if, from the Masons. But Father Matteo, once again, he was a powerful preacher. He was considered another St. Paul. And Father Matteo converted a Mason. And this Mason, I quote him, he tells Father Matteo the following. I remember, Father Mateo said, I remember what a great convert once said to me. He said, I quote, Father, you cannot exaggerate the transcendent importance of the crusade which you are preaching. I know what I am speaking about. The Freemasons of whom I was one for so many years have but one single aim, and that is the de-Christianizing of the family. Once this object is attained in whole or in part, they may safely leave in the possession of Catholics all the cathedrals, churches, and chapels. Of what importance are these buildings of stone when they have taken possession of the sanctuary of the home? In the measure in which the sectarian strategy is successful, 
The victory of hell will be secure. It was dust I reasoned, and for this I worked, Father, when I was in the ranks of the Freemasons. This is real, my friends. Don't believe that it's just some club for a bunch of men playing games. No, this is real. I go back to that quote from the Alta Venditti. He said, let the clergy march under your banner Why they naively believe they are marching under the banner of the apostolic keys. After the council and then John Paul became, the papacy became a cult of personality. It's ridiculous. They, nobody understands the, the office of the pope no more. And they, all of a sudden, after that, if anybody criticized the pope, we're told we're not allowed to criticize the pope. That's not Catholic. It's not. And they, they think they're marching under the banner of the church. They're not. Because St. Paul corrected Peter in Galatians. He said, I resisted Peter to his face. Some say, some translation, I rebuked him to his face because he was to blame. Peter was humble. He accepted the correction of Paul, St. Paul, because he was right. He was right. And he, and he changed. So this is what the Masons have brought it back, and this is about. But our only hope is in the Immaculate. My friends, we have to do everything in our power to live holy lives. We have to fight for our own souls and the souls of our loved ones and the souls of our enemies. And that's the beauty of St. Maximilian with the consecration. We're praying. He went right for, he wanted to go, like I said, to the Grand Master and convert him. He didn't back down. He didn't say, oh, I don't want to offend you. Because the truth sets you free. And St. Maximilian was so imbued with the love of the Immaculate, it was hard to resist that man. I mean, it was beautiful. When, when, when young friars would enter Neo Pocolano, you see the fruits of this man. Neo Pocolano, my friends, is the city of the Immaculate. At one time, St. Maximilian Kobe had 800 friars. Now, I lived a religious life, and I was blessed to be formed in the school of St. Maximilian Colby Tolley. I have a fourth vow consecration. And they said, you read these men's, uh, uh, when they tell you, when they, little young, young men, 14, 15, come to Neopocolano, they, you know, you're afraid, you walk in. They said, the minute St. Maximilian looked at you, smiled at you, they said, all, all the anxiety, at least. He said, he, they all said he was more loving than their own mother. Because he was filled with the love of the Immaculate. When I entered my, my order, you know, the superior told, uh, told us, there was two of us. He says, welcome to Our Lady's Penitentiary. <laughs> he was no St. Maximilian. <laughs> and, but the bottom line is, because he followed Our Lady, as Father Rodriguez went down the list yesterday, and read the true, devo uh, true devotion of Our Lady, St. Uh, Louis de Montfort, you could, people pawn themselves off as slaves of our ladies. But they, no, you're, if you have true devotion, you imitate her virtues more than anything. And so we have to imitate her virtues. St. Maximilian tried to imitate her totally, 100%. And what, how can he, you have any idea, 800 friars in one friary working for our lady. It was a whole city. They had carpenters, firemen, tailors, shoemakers. The printing press went constantly, 24 hours a day, because he, to, to work for the Immaculate, we want to spread her word through the whole world. And he stopped. He was relentless. He never stopped. He was very sick. He had tuberculosis. He never stopped working. Only, but he was totally obedient. He had no money to start uh, Neil Pocolana, and he said, how am I going to do this? He goes, prays in front of the statue. The money he needs is right there. He looks down found an envelope with enough money. He trusted Our Lady in everything. And he didn't consider it his work. He considered it the mother of God's work. And he says, this is Our Lady's place, and if she wants, she could stop it whenever she wants. And she did when he went to the concentration camp. But at that time in the Franciscan order, you know what I mean? There was only around 2,100 conventual Franciscans in the whole world. You know what that means? He had over one-third of the whole order one-third of the conventional order in one friary. It's extraordinary. And there was so much charity in that friary. 
It was beautiful. Only a saint like him could pull something off like that. Only a saint. And so I, I really advise you to really read, entrench yourself in, in St. Maximilian's writings. And you're fortunate you could read Polish. And now even in America now, they translated his uh, complete works in two volumes. It's over a thousand pages each. And you, and you start studying the Mariology of St. Maximilian Kolbe. I believe hopefully one day he will be a doctor to church for Mariology. He, he really deserves it. So St. Maximilian, he opened up the, the city, the Immaculate, and then he ended up going to all nations. He went to China. He went to Japan. He opened up another uh, neo Pocolano in Japan and printing thousands. Imagine how, how many people would go to Japan and they looked at him. As, you know, people mocked him, other friars too. They said, how are you going to go to Japan? You don't even speak Japanese. How are you going to put out the, 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 the Knights of the Immaculate in a language you don't know? Guess what? He did it. He did it because he believed, you know, with Our Lady, all things are possible. So once again, in 1930, he went to the city of Immaculate, Japan. So consecration, my friends, to the Immaculate is a sign of predestination. St. Maximilian gave himself totally to the Blessed Virgin Mary, and therefore he reached full union with Christ on earth. We know through some of his writings that at the end of his life, a lady confirmed that, that basically he was confirmed in grace, which means that he would go to heaven. He wouldn't lose his soul. So true, true consecration to the Blessed Virgin Mary, once again, is a sign of predestination. It's a sign. And so this is how St. Maximilian Kobe established everything. I want to read to you some quotes from him to understand his spirit of the Immaculate. And, and, and it's so deep and beautiful. And this is what a great saint Our Lady produced. St. Maximilian says, God, in his infinite goodness, gives us a taste of some of the joy which will be our crown, so as to draw us towards himself and enkindle in us a spirit of fervor. If we strive with all our strength to cooperate with the grace of God, to spread his kingdom through the Immaculate in ourselves and others, we shall oftentimes experience that blissful peace of a child who gives himself without limit into the hands of his mother. He does not worry about anything, nor is he afraid of anything. All around us, the tempest will rage. Dunder will strike. Yet we who are dedicated entirely to the Immaculate shall be protected. We shall be working for the salvation of souls and then rest with perfect confidence. End of that quote. What a beautiful thing. But he's telling us that all around us, tempest will rage, thunder will strike. Yet we who are dedicated entirely to the Immaculate shall be protected. So St. Louis de Montfort tells us when it's in, that when in Genesis 3.15, where the serpent will strike out Our Lady's heel, she shall crush his head. He, St. Louis tells us the heel of Our Lady is those that are consecrated to her. We're in a war. There's going to be casualties in a war. But we're going to win. And we're going to win. We can't, when you're with Our Lady, she will strengthen you. She will get you to the cross. And she'll keep you there at the cross. I said yesterday in the question and answer, the problem with the church today is nobody wants to go to the cross. Nobody wants to be nailed with Jesus Christ. Nobody wants to lay down their life like St. Maximilian Kolbe for his enemies. Are you willing to be nailed to the cross? Are you willing to climb up on that cross for Jesus to save your soul, to save the souls of your children? Are you willing? If you consecrate yourself to Our Lady, she will keep you at the foot of the cross. Why was St. John of the the evangelist, the only apostle to stay at the cross. They all fled because he clinged to the Blessed Virgin. And our Lord gave his mother to St. John at the cross. But he clung to Our Lady, therefore he was able to stand. 
we too must stand at the cross because there's no salvation without it. And only Our Lady has the graces for you that you need to endure the onslaught. And as Catholics, we're all called once you're confirmed, you become soldiers of Christ. You have an obligation to defend Christ in his church by word and by deed. And I read recently about what happened in Poland here where there was a big rosary rally and the LGBTQ community came and, you, and the Polish, beautiful Polish people, Catholics, formed a circle, a human circle, to prevent them from getting in there. Praise God. <clears throat> That's the spirit we need today. We don't want to kill these people. We want to convert them. And we have to pray for their poor souls because the devil owns them. We need this, what St. Maximilian Kolbe says. He goes on. I'm going to quote again, another quote. And again, crosses will befall us. Beside the grace of God, inflaming our hearts will stir up in us a real thirst for unlimited sufferings. Unlimited sufferings. To be humiliated, despised, and forgotten in order that through these sufferings we may testify as to how much we love our Father in heaven, our best friend and his most loving mother, the Immaculate. Suffering is the school of love. Whew. I don't know about you, but it's hard to, you know, you're praying, you want to pray for unlimited suffering, thirst for unlimited suffering. To, you pray to be humiliated? Are you praying to be spies and be forgotten? We should. Because that's what God wants from us. And it's only possible with Our Lady. Only. She has those graces for you to do this. To be conformed to the cross. So, suffering is a school of love. Expansion and strength seemingly sad, yet always rejoicing. This is the ideal of life. And then although there be a whole legion of most bitter foes against us, we shall find true friends who, united by sincere love and a common ideal, will console us in our sorrow and support us in our weaknesses so that we may never despair, but steadfastly and bravely trust only in God through the Immaculate and fight unto death. All this is only a part of our reward. We must not, however, expect consolation to accompany each of our crosses but only when our loving mother, Immaculata, seeing our weakness and carrying a cross will come to our aid and lighten the burden. With heartfelt gratitude and humility, we must accept our love and help as an incentive to pray more fervently for strength, zeal to draw souls to God through her. My friends, this is beautiful, beautiful spirituality. But I want you to really examine yourself today. Or do you have this spirit that St. Maximilian had? Our lady is offering it to you now. She says how we have to surround, he says, St. Maximilian Kobe says that we surround ourselves with others that will bring us consolation. That's why it's important to join the militia of the Immaculate, that you're guided by a good priest who's under the Immaculate that you have others that are there to strengthen you in your, when you're carrying a cross because we're not meant to carry it alone and that she will help us. I go on with just a couple of more quotes. St. Maximilian says, Oh, we shall merit many more graces if we are plunged into exterior and interior darkness, filled with sorrow, exhausted, unconsoled, persecuted at each step, surrounded by continual failures, abandoned by all, ridiculed, scoffed at, as was Jesus on the cross. We must, however, pray with all our strength for those who persecute us. We must strive to draw them to God through the Immaculate and unite them with him as closely as possible. My friends, this is tough, tough, but it's the way to heaven. It's the way to sanctity. This is what St. Maximilian, he lived this. He didn't just preach it. He lived it. Exhausted, unconsoled, persecuted at each step, surrounded by continual failures, abandoned by all, ridiculed, scoffed at, as Jesus was on the cross. My friends, you are Catholics, and I'm sure all of you here are suffering because we, the enemy 
is within the church more than anything. Our own, the vicar of Christ, the Pope, mocks us if we're Catholic. He mocks a priest who wears a cassock or a habit. This is what's going on. But we got to pray. And we will be persecuted, and we got to pray, especially for those that persecute us. Once again, only through Our Lady is this possible. He goes on, the grace of God will then inflame our hearts with such love that we will be burning with the desire of sufferings. Suffering without limits, humiliation, mockery, anxiety, forgetfulness, so that through all of this we may show how we love our best father and friend and his dearest mother, Immaculata. Suffering is definitely a school of love, of strength. I told you yesterday, I'll tell you again. People will mock us. They mock Christ. Christ seemed like he was a failure. The Jews were expecting a Messiah that would come and crush their enemies physically, the Romans. And what happened? He hung upon the cross. And I, I love the road to Emmaus, one of my favorite scriptures. And after our Lord rose from the dead and he's walking, he disguises his divinity. And he comes up behind his disciples and they didn't know, realize it was him. They said, and they said, don't you know what happened? The one who we believe was the Messiah. He died. Once again, in other words, he was a failure. We died when Caiaphas yelled, you know, come down from the cross if you're the son of God. And he didn't come down. They're going to do the same to us. They're going to mock us. They want you to abandon the immaculate. They want you to abandon this school of suffering. They want you, we're, we're trained in this society, America, all the riches, we seek comfort. That's not the way to heaven. That's not the way to heaven. It's the way to hell. So Maximilian goes on, he says, there is no need to grieve when we do not see the fruits of our work on this earth. You don't want to see him. You know why? Because your head will get too swollen. If God starts showing you the good works you did, uh, converted this one, that one, you'll start thinking you did it, not our lady. He says, perhaps it is the will of God that we reap them after death. In this world, someone else may enjoy them. After death, the Immaculate will complete her work by making use of us. And then we shall labor much more than on this poor earth. Where in holding out our hands to others, we must be very cautious not to fall ourselves. Be careful. So we see, you know, we're running out of time, but we see St. Maximilian Kolbe towards the end of his life, how the Nazis came and took him to the dead camp. And when you read the accounts of his life in the dead camp, he was a true light of God. He brought the Immaculate to that prison camp that was literally a hell on earth and he brought comfort to everyone he never thought about himself he was starving himself like everyone else and he would give his bread his little cup of tea to other prisoners he said no they need it more than me he had tuberculosis he would sit there that you know and he would sit at the end uh you know one of his beds they put him on it was just a wooden planks and he would want to sit at the most uncomfortable spot why? So that he could run to absolve those who were dying. That he could console his men. He was a true priest. What is a priest? And, I, and I'll tell you what a priest is, but when he was, when, when Francis Guy Nietzsche was called to die because we know one man escaped, so ten of the men had to die, I had the privilege of meeting Francis Guy Nietzsche myself, and, uh, and he spent the rest of his life talking about the Immaculata and St. Maximilian. And he cried, he was crying because he had a wife and children. And St. Maximilian stepped out of line. He says, I want to take his place. It's a very profound answer now when the, when the Gestapo said to him, who are you? I am a priest. Whew. Speaks volumes. I am a priest. A priest participates in the one true priesthood of Jesus Christ. A priest is a mediator between God and the people and the people and God. But Maximilian took it even farther too because he wanted to be a total priest like Christ and he also became a victim. 
Manny, that is such a big thing. But you could see from the quotes that I just read how he lived out that spirit of victimhood. He was a total victim for Christ, and he came to lay down his life because that's what a priest does. He continues the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. That's what he does. Absolving sins, anointing those dying, preaching the gospel that sets you free. St. Maximilian did all this. And he, once again, I am a priest. Okay? And so we know St. Maximilian Kobe then went into the bunker, and they stripped you totally of all your clothes, and they put ten of them in there. And he went in, and, in, and the guards testified. They would see bright lights coming out of the bunker that would blind them. Instead of hearing screams, because most people that they put in there, they would start eating each other because there's no food. There's no place to relieve yourself, right? And, and, and it's a horrible death. Starvation is a wicked way to go, but then dehydration is even So they had a boat going on. But they testify to God that coming out of that bunker, they would hear beautiful hymns to the Immaculate. And St. Maximilian ushered every one of those souls into heaven. That he didn't let go of his life until every last soul was in heaven safe. That's a real priest. Greater love than this no man has than to lay down his life for his brother. So, my friends, we could see the fruits of St. Maximilian's life. There's a beautiful part in Mass, one of my most favorite parts, after the priest receives the Holy Eucharist. Before he receives, consumes the precious blood, the priest says this, what return shall I make to the Lord for all he has given me? I will take the chalice of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Praising, I will call upon the Lord and I shall be saved from my enemies. St. Maximilian lived that right to the end. He drank from the chalice of suffering. He has a great glory in heaven. I want to end with a story, my friends, to encourage you. I want to get the cross how powerful consecration to the Blessed Virgin Mary is. It is so powerful. It blows my mind. The more and more I study it and try to live it. And I constantly tell people, you, especially parents, I was always told you can only consecrate yourself, I was taught. And unless you're a parent, you could consecrate your children because you have maternal and paternal rights to the Immaculate. Sign of predestination once again. But this story, I learned something. It's really powerful. It's about a man named Henry Cohen. Henry Cohen was an atheistic Jew, and he was a, he was a organist. He was a very gifted organist. And one day, he... They needed him to play at benediction. He didn't believe in the church, in the Catholic church. He came, and he was playing at benediction. And all of a sudden, when the priest lift up the monstrance to give the blessing, he was, our Lord penetrated Henry Cohen, a Jew. And he said he was driven down, and our Lord revealed to him who he was in the true faith. Henry Cohen became a Carmelite priest. A Carmelite priest from a... A Jew not practicing even his Jewish faith, he becomes a Catholic priest. Okay? Harry Cohen would consecrate his mother thousands and thousands of times because she was a Jew. And he said, my mother will go to hell if she dies a Jew. Imagine this is your mother. You're thinking your mother's going to go to hell. And she would go to hell if she died a Jew. And that's what the church teaches. And we don't wish that on anyone. So his mother died, and he was preaching, and he was devastated because there was no visible sign that she came into the church, okay? She died a Jew. All, that's all he knew, and he couldn't figure it out. He said, there must be something more that I'm missing. God would certainly hear my prayers all these years, praying for my mother. And so John, St. John Vianney was alive. And he went to confess to St. John Vianney one day. And John Vianney put his hand on him and said, My son, 
He didn't even tell them what was going on. He said, my son, in the future, on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, you will receive a letter that will bring you much comfort. Much comfort. Six years later. Six years. And that's one question you, sh you better put to yourself right away. Why did God let him wait six years? He receives this letter, and it was from a mystic. And she was a well-known mystic approved by bishops of her time. And she says in the letter that this, he wrote, she writes a letter to him. He receives it on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception six years after he went to John Vianney. And in the letter, this lady says that a woman came to her who knew him and said her name was, uh, this lady's name was Annie. She said, why would God, what kind of God is it that wouldn't hear Father Cohen, who's so faithful to him, hear his prayers? That his mother died a Jew and she's lost? How can God do that? So that lady went into prayer. And, and this is what our Lord's response was to the mystic. And she wrote this in the letter. Why does Anna always want to sound the secrets of my justice? And why does she seek to penetrate mysteries that she cannot comprehend? Tell her that I do not owe my grace to anyone. <laughs> that I give it to whom I please. And that in acting in this way, I do not cease to be just and justice itself but that she may know that rather than not keep the promise that I have made to prayer, I will upset heaven and earth, and that every prayer that has my glory and the salvation of souls for object is always heard when it is clothed in the necessary qualities. He added, and to prove to you this truth, I willingly make known that which passed at the moment of the death of the mother of Father Cohen. My Jesus then enlightened me with a ray of his divine light and had me, on, this is his mother now, and had me understand or rather to see in him that which I want to try to relate. This is the myth. At the moment where the mother of Father Herman was on the point of rendering her last breath, at the moment that she seemed deprived of all awareness, almost without life, Mary, our good mother, presented herself before her divine son and prostrated at his, his feet. She said to him, pardon and mercy, O oh my son, for this soul who is going to perish yet another instant and she will be lost, lost for eternity. I beseech you, do for the mother of my servant Herman that which you would like to be done for your own if she was in her place and if you were in his. The soul of his mother is his most precious good. He has consecrated her to me a thousand times. He has consecrated her to the tenderness and the solicitude of my heart. Could I suffer her to perish? No, no. This soul is mine. I will it. I claim it as an inheritance as the price of your blood and of my sufferings at the foot of your cross. Hardly had the sacred supplant ceased speaking when a strong, powerful grace came forth from the source of all graces, from the adorable heart of our Jesus, and came to enlighten the soul of the poor dying Jewish, instantly triumphing over her stubbornness and resistance. This soul immediately turned herself with love and confidence towards him who mercy had pursued her as far as the arms of death and said to him, O oh Jesus, God of the Christians, God whom my son adores, I believe, I hope in thee, have pity on me. In this cry heard by God alone, which came from the intimate depths of the heart of the dying, of the dying woman, one closed the sincere sorrow of her obstination for her sins, the desire of baptism, the expressed uh, will to receive it and to live according to the rules of the precepts of a holy religion if she had been able to return to life. This leap of faith and hope in Jesus was the last sentiment of that soul. It was made at the moment when she brought towards the throne of divine mercy. 
breaking away the weak bonds which held her to her mortal casing. She fell at the feet of him who had been her savior a moment before being her judge. After this, our Lord said, Make this known to Father Herman. It is a consolation that I wish to accord to his long sorrows so that he will bless and have blessed everywhere the goodness of the heart of my mother and her power over mine. So, my friends, this is the power of the Immaculate. She wants us all in heaven. God wants us all in heaven. And we have a chance to participate in the salvation of others. If we put ourselves under her mantle, if we follow the consecrations like St. Louis the Moffat, St. Maximilian Kolbe, many lessons we can learn from this story. Number one, never give up on a soul, even after they die, no matter how bad it looks. Okay? Number two, why did God let Blessed Cohen wait six long years? Why? I believe because there's no time with God. And he wanted them to wear out his knees and pray more and more. And God could apply graces before someone, you know, ahead of time. Just like he, the graces for the Immaculate Conception was merited by our Lord on the cross, but he applied it to our lady ahead of time. Same thing with souls. That there is baptism of desire, contrary to what Fenianites say, that they don't believe in baptism of desire and abide. That Our Lady of Fatima has told us that many souls go to hell because no one prays for them. No one prays for them. So we end with this, my friends. Let us be devoted before all things to the Immaculate. Let us follow St. Maximilian. Let him be your guide. Get all his writings. Read from him every day. Be part of the militia of the Immaculate. And you will not only save your soul, or you will bring thousands and thousands to heaven with you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. We give you thanks, O oh my God, for all your blessings, for you live and reign forever. A Lady of Fatima. In the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost.